The desert holds an ancient secret, a secret guarded for centuries. But secrets can't be kept forever. forever. A mountain in a forbidden land, shrouded in mystery. Many have searched for it, few have seen it. When I saw a question mark in the Bible, what does that do on there? I don't know why it's been ignored. I guess that tradition is so strong. Yet in Saudi Arabia, we find something doesn't belong there. The world needs to know that this is not nothing legend, not allegory. This is real. I just saw it. Now, two men have the proof. Larry looks over and looks the right eye and said, Bob, I think we're making history. Epic myth becomes burning truth. Mountain of fire. The precise location of Mount Sinai has eluded both archaeologists and theologians for centuries. It is the mountain of legend, chronicled in the Old Testament book of Exodus. The mountain where Moses saw the glory of the God of the Hebrews, where he fell to his knees in fear before a burning bush, and where he received the stone tablets containing holy law etched by the finger of God. Tradition has placed this fabled mountain squarely in the middle of the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. But an unlikely pair of adventurers believe differently. Well, in Orange County, California, I was a policeman for years. Started off being in patrol and then went into being a crime scene investigator, collecting evidence and analyzing crime scenes. And I was on the first SWAT team that they implemented on the police department. And it was pretty intense. I've spent the last uh, 40 years basically as a speculator trading stocks and commodities. I have a degree in the journalism from the University of Oregon. I was raised in a religious family, so the, the history of religion has always interested me. Larry Williams is, is certainly one of the most interesting people I've ever met. A famous man, ran for United States Senator twice, Ronald Reagan campaigned for him, world-renowned commodities trader, a man of wealth. You just instantly see in Bob that here was a guy that I had a lot of natural affinity with. I just felt good being around him, he was exciting. I walk away from business and do interesting things as well in my life, because life should be more than just business. I've always been enamored with treasure hunting, the great unknown, great stories about things like, oh yeah, that's a really cool story, but is there anything to it or is it a myth? Well, I met a man named Jim Irwin who was the eighth man to walk on the moon. He was a piece of history. When he came back from the moon, he wanted to do something different with his life. He felt that he had a calling, a calling by God, to go look for lost locations in the Bible. He was involved heavily with looking for Noah's Ark at the time, and I thought that was fascinating. When you look at the great archaeological discoveries of the world, they have not been found by archaeologists. Whether it's the Machu Picchu or the lost city of Ur, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you go on and on, they're found by people that are adventurers. Well, that little question mark in the back of Bible is really what got me involved in this entire thing. My friendship with Bob and everything else notwithstanding, when I saw a question mark in the Bible, that piqued my interest. That, what does that do in there? Why do people know? I thought everybody knew where it was. That question mark got me to spend a small fortune in this search. That search begins with a series of clues that came in the form of a mysterious letter written by explorer David Fossold and given to them by Irwin, hinting that the real Mount Sinai might actually be in Saudi Arabia. We had kind of a, a, an idea of where to go and how to get there, but David wasn't able to come back with any documentation because he was arrested and couldn't get anything out other than what he carried in his mind. Cornuk and Williams agree. They will use the book of Exodus as their roadmap. Through research, they begin to compile a list of sites they will have to find to identify the true Mount Sinai. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, the Israelites fled toward this holy mountain as they were pursued by the armies of Pharaoh. <laughs> They decide to start their quest by examining the site of the traditional Mount Sinai in Egypt, known simply as St. Catharines. 
It received its name, some say, by Queen Helena, mother of Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, and that she guessed that this was the mountain. And I guess being the mother of the Emperor of Rome, you have a little bit of power, and they put it down on a map, and then tradition just carries on. The Roman Church perpetuated it, we know, quite extensively in the 4th century as being Mount Sinai. I climbed this mountain several years ago with Jim Irwin, the astronaut. We stood on top of the traditional Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula. We looked around. Very disappointing. Beautiful mountain, beautiful scenery, awe-inspiring. But none of the geographical, geological formations fit with what the Bible was telling us. It, it, this wasn't out of Egypt. And St. Catharines is clearly in the Egyptian peninsula. It just didn't work. It wasn't on the backside of any desert. It wasn't in the area that the Bible said. We had the stunning realization, as many who have climbed that mountain have said this just simply is not the place. The book of Exodus tells the story of how God led Moses and the children of Israel through the desert to a point where they were confronted by the Red Sea. If you find the correct crossing site, it's easy to find the mountain. And if you find the mountain, it's easy to find the crossing site. It all comes together. It's like a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you to the correct location in an investigation. And the crossing site, a big part of the Exodus story has just been avoided. People have thought it to be in the Upper Lakes region of the Suez, which is ridiculous. The Bible says that the Egyptians sunk like stones in the mighty sea. We have to have a sea, an ocean, to where they crossed the Red Sea. People seeing the movie have been blown away by what the Red Sea crossing was. Well, I like a little physical reality in, in how this could have happened. As Bob and Larry examine the book of Exodus and take it at face value, another theory begins to emerge. If you read specifically as to what Flavius Josephus says, he describes this ridge of mountains going along, stopping into the sea, precluding them from going any other place. If you look at satellite imagery, it gives a wide, clear area along the western side of the Sinai Peninsula, almost like a highway to the tip and then turning upward, creating like a cul-de-sac area. They probably went through the Red Sea right at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula in a place called Sharm el Sheikh. It's remarkable. It's not like a coral reef surrounding the outside of the tip of a peninsula or something that you see in normal coral reef configurations. This goes right through the sea. And it's interesting to note here that God in scripture says, I will make for you a roadway through the sea. Actually has a coral barrier that comes out and Bob and I have pictures of ourselves at high tide, not low tide, with the tide up to about my waist standing on this barrier, this reef barrier there. They would have had a pedestal under the surface of the water, a wide ribbon of land that goes under the water that when the waters parted they could walk upon that would allow them an escape route and go through the sea. The book of Exodus records that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. So we have the precision of scripture, the historical records, and the physical geography of the area all coming together and creating a picture.